And we saw that Nehemiah was serving as cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And that means that he tasted the food and the wine of the king to make sure that it had not been poisoned. So obviously, King Artaxerxes had a lot of trust in Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is with the king in the citadel of Susa. He is in the uh, fortress palace in the town where Persian kings would go in the winter months. And while he is there, Nehemiah's brother, Hanani, returns from Jerusalem. And Nehemiah asks Hanani, how are the people in and around Jerusalem doing? And what is the condition of the city of Jerusalem? And Hanani and those who had traveled with him gave their report. And it was not good news. They said that the people were in great trouble and disgrace because the walls of the city were still torn down and the gates of the city had been burned. And when Nehemiah hears that news, he sits down and he weeps and he prays. And he prays that God would reveal to Nehemiah what God wants him to do. Sometime later, Nehemiah is with King Artaxerxes and he has a sad look on his face. And the king notices, and so he asks Nehemiah what's wrong. Nehemiah recognizes that as the Lord's timing. And so Nehemiah tells the king, he says, I'm upset. I'm upset because of the condition that my city of Jerusalem is in, and I'm upset because of what the people there are having to endure. And Artaxerxes asks Nehemiah, what is it that you would like me to do? And Nehemiah asks the king for permission to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. And the king agrees. So then Nehemiah asks him for letters giving him safe passage, and he asks the king for lumber to make the repairs. And the king agrees. We know the distance between Susa and Jerusalem is almost a thousand miles. Would have taken months to make the trip. But in the book of Nehemiah, there is no real information about that journey. It just jumps from when the king gives Nehemiah permission to go and when Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem. So if you are there, Nehemiah chapter 2, follow along as I begin reading at verse 11. It says, I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. We are looking at lessons on leadership in the book of Nehemiah. And I said last Sunday that I believe Nehemiah is one of the four greatest leaders in the Bible. Obviously, Jesus is the greatest leader who has ever lived. And we see that in the difference Jesus has made in the world for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Moses is also a great leader. And what we learn from Moses is the importance of delegation and trusting others. I believe Barnabas is one of the greatest leaders in the Bible. And what we see with Barnabas is that he works to build others up in order that they might reach their potential. But there are leadership lessons that we need to learn from Nehemiah. And the lesson we need to learn today is there is no I in lead. There is no I in lead. Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem and he began to put together a plan to accomplish God's objectives. Nehemiah knew that the walls needed to be rebuilt. But how 
exactly were they to go about doing that. And so he heads out at night for this reconnaissance mission. And the way it's described is he goes all the way around the city of Jerusalem in a counterclockwise path. Now, why is it that Nehemiah would make this journey at night? I think there are three possibilities. One is he already knew that Sanballat and Tobiah were opposed, and so he didn't want them to see him. Another possibility is that perhaps he had uh, an inkling that there were some back-channel communications between Sanballat, Tobiah, and some of the leaders in Jerusalem, and so he didn't want those leaders to see him. But I think the primary reason Nehemiah goes on this midnight reconnaissance mission is because he did not yet want the people to get excited until he had his plan formulated. And that gives us a key to leadership. The necessity of clear vision. The necessity of clear vision. Leaders are responsible for developing a vision of how their organization can improve and be better in the future at accomplishing its objectives. Godly leaders must have a vision for how their organizations can improve in the future in order to better accomplish God's objectives. And there are two parts to an effective vision. First of all, is having a mental picture of what that future should look like. The second part is having a reasonable attack plan for how to get there. And so Nehemiah knows that the walls need to be rebuilt. But he begins to go around the city of Jerusalem to try and put that plan into place. He knows that there is, it's going to require lumber. But how many feet of lumber are going to be needed? Maybe he knows that there is going to need to be cement. But how many cubic yards of cement is it going to take? And so he travels around the city of Jerusalem, formulating in his mind this plan. Now, some people are uncomfortable using terms like leadership or vision when it comes to spiritual things and the church. But Jesus had a vision. Jesus had a vision for his ministry. He said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. Jesus had a vision for his target audience. He said that he primarily came for the Jews and not the Gentiles. And Jesus has a vision for the church. We are to go and make disciples by baptizing people and teaching them to obey everything Christ taught. Paul had a vision for his ministry. Paul's vision, according to Acts chapter 9, was that he had been told he was to go and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Paul had a strategy for doing that. He would go and plant churches in the large cities so that the gospel would spread out from there. And Paul had counted the cost. Jesus had told him that he would suffer greatly for the name of Christ. Good, godly leaders establish a clear vision. And a clear vision means several things. A clear vision means that it can be succinctly communicated in a way that motivates people to take action. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody immediately gets on board. That's wishful thinking. People who have done studies of change identify that about 10% of people immediately get on board and start working to help accomplish the vision. About 80% of people need a little more clarity and a little bit more time, but they will eventually adopt the vision and get on board. But then you have a remaining 10% of people who either actively or passively continue to resist the vision. Another necessity for the clear vision is that it helps people be able to see a better future. It helps them be able to see a better future. A good vision acknowledges that there are going to have to be sacrifices and changes, but it helps them see what that future is going to look like so that those sacrifices and changes are worth it and what they are risking if they don't pursue that vision. 
And a clear vision is necessary because it answers questions and simplifies decision making. When I do premarital counseling, I almost always ask the couple to come to the next session with three to five goals that they have agreed on together. And I've had couples come back and say, okay, one of our goals is that we want to buy a house in the country with a big yard so the kids can play outside. I've had others say, oh, one of our goals is that we want to both retire at the age of 55 so we can travel. Some have said one of our goals is to start a business together. I've had a couple say, uh, we have a goal of being on the mission field in two years. And why I ask them to do this is because when you have agreed upon goals, it makes the decision making so much easier and it nips so many disagreements in the bud. For instance, let's say the couple who says, uh, we have a goal of buying this house out in the country. So that's one of their agreed upon goals, but all of a sudden, one of them kind of has this urge to buy a boat. <laughs> okay. They don't have to disagree about the boat. What they do now is they need to have a conversation on whether or not this is getting us closer to the goal we agreed upon of the house out in the country. And so a, a clear vision helps everybody work together in the same direction. Well, for the second leadership lesson, look at verses 16 through 18. Go back into verse 16, it says, The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials um, or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. The second leadership lesson, and there is no I in lead, is the necessity of team building. The necessity of team building. Look again at what verse 16 says. Nehemiah has this vision, and he has this plan, and part of the plan is that there needs to be a team of people in order that it might be accomplished. He says that he hasn't told anyone of his plan. He hadn't told those who would be doing the work. Nehemiah was dependent on others because Nehemiah knew that if you have a big God-honoring project or goal, it's more than Nehemiah could do himself. He needed to depend on others. Nehemiah wanted the people of God to have the opportunity to serve God in order that they might see the moving of God and give praise to God. Let me read that again. Nehemiah wanted the people of God to have the opportunity to serve God so that they might see the moving of God and give praise to God. Lean over to somebody and say, that's pretty good. Let's read it together. Nehemiah wanted the people of God to have the opportunity to serve God in order that they might see the moving of God and give praise to God. Now look at verse 17. There are three words that I have circled in my Bible in verse 17. They are we, us, and we. You see what Nehemiah is doing here? He's building a team. He's building a team. Imagine the response Nehemiah would have gotten if he had gone to those people and said, you got a big problem here. Now it's not my problem because I've been living in Susa. I don't live in Jerusalem. But you got a big problem. You better get on the stick and you better get this thing fixed. That probably wouldn't have gone over too well, would it? No. Because when you blame and criticize, you squelch motivation. But when you identify with the problem, you encourage motivation. There are two types of motivation. There is extrinsic motivation and there is intrinsic 
motivation. Extrinsic motivation appeals to our material attitudes. Now that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bad thing. It works. For instance, you say to your child, you do your homework first and then you can play video games. Right? The video game is the extrinsic motivation and so they do their homework. It works. Businesses. Businesses offer bonuses of a, if a sales goal is met. It's extrinsic motivation. So it doesn't mean it's bad. It works. Problem is, it's not the best form of motivation, and it has diminishing returns. Sometimes churches offer children prizes or gifts if they memorize Bible verses, or if they invite their friends, or for their attendance. And that's perfectly fine, but if you have to keep offering prizes and gifts to adults, then there's a problem. Okay? Nehemiah does not use extrinsic motivation here. He doesn't pressure the people. He doesn't push the people. He doesn't cajole the people. He doesn't beg the people. He uses intrinsic motivation. He says, we have a problem. This is dangerous for all of us. Let's work together on fixing this wall. And so the response of the people was, let's do it. And verse 18 says that when the people understood that the rebuilding of the wall was a God thing, and when the people understood that Nehemiah as the leader was for them, and that Nehemiah as the leader would do everything he could to see that they succeed, they were on board. And what do they say? It says, they replied, let us start rebuilding. Nehemiah had built his team. Now, we're not going to take the time to read through it, but chapter 3, we're not going to read through chapter 3. It's just a bunch of names and landmarks. But it tells of all those who started working on the rebuilding of the wall and the areas of the wall that they started rebuilding. And again, the description goes around the city of Jerusalem in a counterclockwise telling. This chapter tells of high officials in the city working on the wall. The high priest, the other priests, the politicians. This tells of wealthy people in the city working on the wall. Tradesmen in the city working on the wall. The average mom and Joe working on the wall. You know who's not found in chapter 3? Nehemiah. <laughs> now there's a Nehemiah mentioned in verse 16, but that's a different Nehemiah. Nehemiah is not the one pouring the cement. Nehemiah is not the one putting the stones back in the wall because he has his team and he entrusts his team to do the work. Thomas Jefferson said, there are two kinds of leaders those who trust people, and those who fear the people. <laughs> Some people in leadership positions don't trust their people. The attitude seems to be, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. And so the follow-through on that is that people have to be closely watched, and they have to be micromanaged, lest they do anything wrong, or lest they, they slack in their responsibilities. But people don't respond well to that kind of leadership. People don't respond with joy to that kind of leadership. They don't respond with motivation to that kind of leadership. You remember when Jesus sent the 72 people out to do the work of ministry? Now we're familiar with the 12 apostles, but this is 72. Maybe it was the 12 apostles and 60 others. We don't know for sure. But Jesus put a team together of people who who had a burden for ministry and were willing to do ministry. And he called them together, and no doubt he instructed them, and he warned them. He told them that there would be rejection, that there would be opposition. He told them not to take much in the way of supplies, but to put their trust in the Lord. And then he sent them out, and he trusted them to do the work of ministry. And when they came back, do you remember what they said? They were so excited they were so enthused. They were so filled with joy. They were so 
eager to do the next thing in ministry. Why? Because Jesus had built his ministry team and he trusted them to do the work of ministry. Good, godly leaders are team builders. And by the way, if you are in Christ, you are on the Jesus team. Okay? And, and he is trusting you to do his ministry and to fulfill the work of ministry today. Well, there's a third lesson related to there is no I in lead and vision and team building. And it's here in verses 19 and 20. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. So as, as the vision is communicated, and as the team is being built and released to begin the work, what do we see? We see the inevitability of opposition. The inevitability of opposition. Notice two things about this opposition. First, the number of those opposing it has increased. Earlier in chapter 2, we've already heard about Sanballat and Tobiah. And up in chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 10, it says that Sanballat and Tobiah were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. And that word very much disturbed, it means that they were angry, they were upset, and they were ready to do mischief. They were ready to do mischief. But here, it's not only Sanballat and Tobiah, but now we're also told about another individual, Geshem the Arab. He has joined the opposition. When you're going to try something in the power of God, to the glory of God, there's going to be opposition. And those who oppose you will try to recruit more people to oppose you too. Another thing to see here. Notice the tactic that they use on Nehemiah. It says, they questioned the motives of rebuilding the wall, and they tried to discourage the people from doing the work. It says that they mocked the people. That means that they made fun of the way the Jews talked. It says that they ridiculed us. They treated the Jews with contempt. And not only that, but they made the accusation that the Jews were acting in rebellion against King Artaxerxes. The inference was, if the king knew what you were doing, he would be against it. The intimidation. You're rebelling against the king. And when he finds out what it is that you are doing, he is going to come and he is going to destroy it. So all of your efforts will have been for naught. And you're making a big mistake following this guy, Nehemiah, because he's leading you in the wrong direction. And as a leader, Nehemiah steps up and he defends the will of God. And as a leader, Nehemiah steps up and he defends the team that's working on this project. He says to the opposers, God is going to give us success because God wants this. So you can't stop us. And he says, currently and historically, you have no claim on this land, so you have no authority. Get out of our way because we're moving ahead. As Nehemiah led others in rebuilding the wall, he never let his eyes drift from God. He continued to look to God to make sure that he was doing the will of God in a godly way. In a godly way. And Nehemiah was an extraordinary leader that we need to learn leadership lessons from. Now next Sunday morning, we're going to talk about the hardest part of completing a project. I hope you'll be here. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank You so much for this man, Nehemiah, who if it hadn't been for his leadership in this rebuilding project, this reconstruction of the walls of Jerusalem, he would have been lost in obscurity because he was a cupbearer to a king in a distant land. But here he is, recorded for us in Your Word because You want us to learn from him. I pray that we do. I pray that we do. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son Jesus, the greatest leader of all, to die on the cross for our sins. I pray that if there is someone here who does not know Jesus, that they would feel your Holy Spirit tugging on their heart, leading them to the cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.